Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ILN Talk Show. This is our 15th episode, um, and we're happy uh, to have with us uh, Mr. Salih Yansun, uh, who is uh, Turkish, but he is very, very um, uh, knowledgeable about both Turkey and Tunisia. Today, we're going to be talking about the differences, uh, differences and similarities between uh, the democratic experiences in Tunisia and Turkey. Uh, Mr. Salih Yansun is currently um, uh, teaching as an assistant professor in Indiana. Uh, sorry. See, I told you. <laughs> That's why I record. Okay, let's start. So Mr. Salah Hansun is actually uh, uh, currently um, a PhD uh, candidate um, in political science in Indiana University, and he's going to be uh, soon teaching as an assistant professor um, in Virginia, Virginia Military Institute. So we're very happy to have you with us today, Mr. Salah. Thank you, Tasneem. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So, um, as some of you might know, um, Mr. Sali has been part of the Island Network, and he participated in our uh, last Tunisia conference, um, and he added a lot through his expertise, um, and we're hopeful that he's going to be doing the very same thing today in our show. Um, so, Tunisia and Turkey. First of all, we have the very same flag, I mean, almost. Yes. A lot of people, you know, can't tell the difference. Yeah. Um, we have very strong ties um, culturally and even ethnically because of the Ottoman Empire, of course. Um, but before we dig deeper into the, you know, the democratic experiences, um, you know, uh, uh, democratic similarities um, and differences of each country, let's start by, you know, um, you know, defining the these democratic experiences in both Turkey and Tunisia. For for Tunisia, I think it's pretty pretty self-explanatory because, you know, it literally started um, in 2011 after the revolution. Before that, we did not have you know, any form of, of, of democracy. Uh, what about what about Turkey? Yes, uh, if we exclude the uh, experience uh, of the Ottoman Empire with some with a uh, uh, legislative assembly, mm -hmm. uh, the period. Yes. If we just focus on modern Turkey's experience, the uh, democracy, the multi-party democracy in Turkey began in 1950. Mm -hmm. uh, under a two-party structure. And from 1923 till 1950, Turkey was ruled under a single-party regime, similar yeah. to the experience of Tunisia. Turkey had, uh, from 1950 up until current period, contemporary era, Turkey had uh, multiple military coups, military interventions, but nevertheless, you know, it stayed as a multi-party democracy after brief periods of intervention, military was willing to give power back to the uh, legislative assembly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, informally since 2014 and formally since 2017, 2018, Turkey has switched to a presidential system, which yeah. is recent in country's history. Mm -hmm. uh, Tunisia's experience, as you indicated, is obviously different. Tunisia switched to single party rule later than Turkey did because, yes. or because of its experience with colonization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it stayed under single party rule longer than Turkey did. Yes. yes. Uh, Turkey experienced most of the Cold War era under multi-party rule mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. For Tunisia, it was post 9-11 era when it was able to switch to uh, a um, multi-party role, you know, a mixed... Post 9-11? Post 9-11. So 9-11 uh, terror attacks. I, okay. I think these uh, events are important in terms of understanding uh, how parties evolve, how uh, foreign powers respond to democracy mm -hmm. initiatives. So. Cold War was important for uh, the experience of the Turkish parties to institutionalize. And I think 9-11 is also a critical event in terms of how um, foreign powers, particularly Western powers, respond to uh, regime change initiatives. Do you think 9-11 had a, a direct um, you know, influence in democracy in Tunisia? 
I don't think so, but I think that uh, it's back then we were, we were still I, under the Benelli regime. Anyway. Early initiatives. Mm -hmm. I think it possibly postponed some early initiatives and it, it delayed the process possibly, and okay. perhaps uh, the manner in which the transition occurred, you know, it, it might have influenced because uh, it, it, it Tunisia could have transitioned in a more uh, um, conciliatory way, mm -hmm. you know, through through uh, different types of arrangements. But uh, I think in a way, 9-11 strengthened Ben Ali's hand mm -hmm. at that time in terms of keeping the political structure. Because he has been so, using the stair thing a lot as well. So that might have solidified his argument. Also, uh, the in continued instability in the region yes. after 9-11. Mm -hmm. And then US uh, military uh, engagement in Iraq. Yes. And uh, the continuing Arab uprisings I also think. challenged, you know, put a lot of stress on Tunisia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not, I'm not uh, a... It's, it's hard to argue one way or another, but this is where Tunisia is. Where no, but I see your point. Yeah, yeah, you, you do have a point in there. I mean, most of the time people do not think about 9-11 and its impact on Tunisian democracy. But yes, you do have a point, geopolitically speaking. Um, when it comes to, you know, after the revolution and then the, you know, 10 solid years that we had, a lot of people call them democratic um, what do you think of them before the arrival of the current president and what he did? We'll come to that later. Yeah, so um, I came to Tunisia. First time I came to Tunisia in 2015. Mm -hmm. and since then, I've been, you know, occasionally visiting Tunisia. We've been well, visiting us all the time. Yeah, yeah. just say it. <laughs> and <laughs> and I, I talked to a lot of uh, smart, you know, uh, people, patriot people like you and other Tunisians. Okay. And what I notice is that over time, uh, people's enthusiasm has declined. Yes. And this was, this was even before Kai Said took power. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know how people were talking about their experience in 2015 is quite different to how they were talking in 2019. Mm -hmm. Let's and, go back to 2015 and compare yeah. it to what, were, what was happening in Turkey, because a lot of people were saying that another party is trying to do exactly what Erdogan was doing. Um, what so, do you think of that? Okay, you could call it luck, you could call it skill, you, you mm -hmm. could, but uh, in early years of AKP, Erdogan managed to achieve so many things. Mm -hmm. AKP managed to achieve so many things uh, for Turks, for Turkish yes. citizens, whether related to um, improvements in healthcare, um, access to education, infrastructure, uh, hmm? infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure uh, making Turkey, Turkey, I should say, making yes. Turkey and attractive. <laughs> Managing business. to change the name officially yes. is not it's not an easy thing. You have uh, to making, have an impact. Making Turkey an attractive destination. Uh, these have been good, solid achievements mm -hmm. for Erdogan. And I think uh, part of the reason, regardless of people's complaints, why people stick with him, have to do with these early achievements. But we should put in context that when Erdogan acquired power, when Erdogan came to power, when AKP came to power uh, in 2002 in Turkey, mm -hmm. uh, the military was already fragile. You yes. know, military institution was already fragile. There was some bureaucratic resistance, but it was not uh, very, very hard. Uh, Erdogan could break through it, could, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it, it struggled with it and it managed to overcome. Whereas in Tunisia, the situation has been very different. First of all, uh, since the beginning, Nahda had to rely on coalition governments. Yes. Uh, so it had, but not only that, institutions have been more segmented than is the case in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. We should we should put in context that you know the the role of UJTT particularly. Yeah. In, in spearheading. Workers union. 
and, yeah. the, and the people on the ground who protested another was kind of a latecomer to revolution okay yeah yani, uh, when it <laughs> when yeah. the revolution began and after did not have did not started basically mm -hmm. it's different in turkey i mean it used to be there but it was yes. banned hmm? it used yes. to be there but yes. it was banned yes but it just came when, back yeah when uh, it was uh, uh, independent organizations people took into streets yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. but by no, no, no. these activities that yeah. led to the revolution. Yes. In Turkey, when we compared when we compared the situation to Turkey, uh, in Turkey, AKP led the revolution itself. Yeah. AKP battled against you know I use a battle metaphor in a metaphorical yeah. way. Struggled against military by itself. Erdogan pushed against bureaucracy by itself. So it was a different type of struggle. Mm -hmm. And we see that continuously, even when we look at the first years of Troika government in Tunisia, yeah. we see a struggle between uh, Nahda and UGTT yeah. for setting the agenda. UGTT being the workers' union. Workers' yeah. union, yes, for setting the agenda, for defining who holds the power, who holds the authority. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was for, not the case in, in Turkey. This was not the case in Turkey because uh, when AKP was leading its struggle, it was the only power capable mm -hmm. of doing it. But do you think that's democratic? I mean, because a lot of people in Tunisia think that the role of the uh, uh, workers union is, is, is fundamental in democracy. It's an independent organization and it has a say in the country. So what do you think of that? It's similar to the French mm. workers union, you know? Hmm. So that's I'm not the really familiar with French case, but mm -hmm. uh, with Tunisian case, I think it's a. I will quote my good friend Bederhan here, who was a guest. Yes, here. last episode. In last episode, uh, it's both a blessing and a curse. I think, mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, as an independent organization, UGTT, uh, you know, has its own autonomy and perhaps can 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 prevent uh power encroachments mm -hmm. some institutions to acquire too much power yes so this is perhaps you know in, when you study revolution you clearly see the role of UGTT mm -hmm. and you know uh, you, you see transition from 2014 till 15 you see the role of UGTT yes these are you could say these are uh, blessings these are great things but on the other hand you look at uh, some structural issues that Tunisia is facing in terms of um, our oversized public sector, in 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 inefficiencies in the public sector, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. inability to implement certain reforms, and even uh, what happened since July 25th, you know, the, ta the, the, the tacit initial support of UJTT, yeah. you see that um, the, the organizations that have too much power can also prevent politics to become the only game in town or the major mm -hmm. game in town. Yeah. Um, and you look at, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, I will go back to Troika government again. Yes. Yeah. Similar, you know, the power struggle with UGTT uh, put a heavy burden on it, perhaps, you know, one, was one of the major factors contributing to its downfall. Mm -hmm. So I will go back to what I said. It's both a blessing and a curse, you know, uh and okay. it is what it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But let's let's go back to the comparison between mm -hmm. both countries. Um so as I said, um maybe uh, a lot of people are believing that uh Anahda party was trying to do what Erdogan is doing in Turkey uh because of um ideal similarities and ideologies. Um do you think so? That's that's the case. Ideologically speaking, I don't know how much ideology contributes to the day the way they approach domestic politics i think both parties want power which is mm. every party wants power i mean yes. that's, that's basics politics one no, i mean islamic but, background let's put it that way um, because as you know here they're like you know um polarization between the islamic background and the secular sec secularism and and stuff so that's how things are ruled in tunisia and it is somehow the case in turkey as well hence the mm -hmm. similarity in politics i think 
very early in the transition, uh, they, <laughs> they would, uh, Fulul Ben Ali, do you know the term Fulul? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So People the, who used to be part of the Ben Ali regime and they're still the, there. Somehow derogatory terms mm. are kind of reminiscent to the rhetoric of AKP okay. <laughs> against Israel, to be honest with you. So early on in the transition, I think um, Ennahda also had this uh, somewhat condescending tone and, uh, uh, you know, feeling that they are the authority right now, sole authority right now, which is mm -hmm. similar to how AKP has been running. Okay. But I think later on, really shortly, this rhetoric changed uh, within the Nahda, okay. uh, particularly as the party uh, engaged in, you know, uh, coalition government with Nidei Tunis. Yes. Uh, but regarding Islamizing society, Nidei Tunis being a secular, um, you know, uh, party. I'm just explaining for yeah. our viewers who are not familiar uh, with Tunisia, Tunisian yes. politics. But I think um, uh, how AKP, the way AKP is Islamizing Tur Turkey, mm -hmm. you know, is different than the way religion is in Tunisia, I think. Okay. Uh, so. the, 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 like regarding regulations on selling alcohol, public events, oh, it's not the same for thing. instance, uh, or uh, LGBT issues, um, uh, Tunisia is already more conservative on these air fields than Turkey is. Okay, yes. so yeah. uh, I don't think the two are compatible in that case because mm -hmm. the, the the comparison levels are different. Yeah, uh, the, the, the it's, it's actually funny because a lot of people, I mean, Turkey is loved by Tunisians mm -hmm. from for two different reasons. The those who believe in, you know, uh, that politics should have Islamic backgrounds love Turkey because of Erdogan. Okay. And those who, <laughs> and those who, um, you know, are more secular in their views, love Turkey because of the same reasons, because there there exists some politics, you know, believing in those in those, you know, uh, values. So it's really interesting. I mean, yeah. This, yeah 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 i i agree with you and i also felt the same way as i spoke to many tunisians across my you know uh, during my research period yeah and and we should you know uh, the ennahda is islamization perhaps uh, concern making tunisia more conservative identity politics period maybe ran from uh, ran for six seven years from mm -hmm. 2011 till uh, maybe 2018. Then it stopped. You think? Well, with the with the uh, uh, report on inheritance rights, you know, the Colibar report perhaps was yeah. the climax uh, of these debates. But then, you know, the the uh, debates began to revolve on different issues. Per ma major one being the socioeconomic yes. issues, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you can run so much on identity politics. Again, I will emphasize one difference. When I spoke to many Tunisians, for instance, regarding okay. headscarf issue, you know, the fact okay. that women are able to enter universities with wearing uh, headscarf. That was the same thing. Mm -hmm. Sorry? That was the same thing. I mean, we experienced the same thing. But not many Tunisians, even headscarf women, attribute this success to Ennahda. Okay. Uh, they attributed to some revolution, some of them attributed to revolution, some of them attributed to uh some uh, female uh, some uh, feminist activists I mean, it should be attributed to the revolution because it granted us freedom that's so, all okay that, that, that's why i'm comparing yeah. this to turkey turkey uh, yeah. many headscarf women still attribute you know the liberal liberation of a headscarf to akp to oh, erdogan. I see. so I see. you know erdogan can rely on this issue uh, very substantive portion of electorate day and night uh, he can uh, mobilize by simply focusing on that issue. And he does that? Does he do that? Yeah, yeah. We will okay. have a new legislation coming up. New, uh, it will be up for a vote prior to our election mm -hmm. about uh, women's right to wear headscarf. It will be a constitutional change, basically. So okay. this, this, this is a large mobilization subject for Erdogan, for instance. Still it mm -hmm. is, but uh, Nahda does not have that. It's, it's, no. a, yeah. it's a major mm -hmm. difference, you know. Even yeah. Uh, Tunisia overall is a more conservative society than Turkey is. And we see that when we look at World Value Survey, for instance, questionnaire, 
we see different answers regarding you know the role of religion in society and other mm -hmm. questions regarding piety as mm -hmm. well Nahda can only control a certain limited segment of conservative base various Erdogan has a very very large you know support among conservatives in Tunisia not only Absolutely. that but also non-conservatives in Turkey support mm -hmm. yeah yeah, right. very, uh, not a lot lost that, uh, you know, uh, touch uh, after yeah. 2011, uh, lost touch with uh, different segments of the population, yeah. except for um, its, its, its core constituency. Yes. So that th these are major differences. Erdogan yeah. perhaps still has a, a political Islamist base at its core, mm -hmm. but it appeals to so many different segments of the population, including Atatürkists, mm -hmm. I can't imagine Nahda getting vote from people who define themselves as Burkibist. No, oh, no, that's not possible. But yeah. Erdogan does that. Erdogan okay. still... But what about him. now? I mean, now after the change in the constitution in Turkey and after the coup in Tunisia, um, what do you think? I mean, are we still calling our, our country as democratic in the first place? I don't think that uh, I wouldn't call Turkey a democratic country. Okay. I also would uh, probably not call Tunisia a democratic country right now. Yes. None of them are democratic countries, but uh, neither of them are fully authoritarian either. So they are not fully democratic. But well, there's no country that's fully democratic to begin with. Yeah, yeah that's for sure. But uh, at least we do have a parliament. We do okay. not have a parliament. They both regret on democracy for sure. Yeah. They both uh, regret on individuals' freedoms for sure. Yeah. But they're not uh, dictatorial rules either. Even in Tunisia? No, I don't think Tunisia is a dictatorial country in a sense that it was during Ben Ali era. But do you believe it was a coup that happened? Uh, how do you define a coup? <laughs> oh, you tell me. Uh, because you you proposed the term, you proposed the... Uh, yeah, because because he literally grabbed all powers, all three powers, and we don't we didn't involve the military because we did, in Tunisia, unlike the rest of the Arab world, we do not have you know the tra mm -hmm. tradition of military of the military you know rule, rule the country. So he came up with this presidential coup, which is something new. I think it was unconstitutional, and I think it was a power grab. Okay, whether it was a coup or not depends on how you define a coup and how you define military's role in it. Okay. When you read the constitution, you know, clause 80 in particular, um, it's it's clear that, you know, he went above and beyond it. And yes. his later actions, there is no justification in constitution. So uh -huh. it was definitely unconstitutional and it was a power grab. Okay. And, uh, so that's my position. What about Turkey? About what? <laughs> So now, is it still as democratic as it used to be before? I'm just trying to compare the two countries. What's your base of comparison for Turkey? Well, um, are, the I wouldn't say power grab, but changes in the constitution. So Turkey right now uh, be, uh, enables majority to rule the country in an unconstrained manner. Okay. So right. President Erdogan right now controls all three branches of government in Turkey, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, I don't think, uh, if, if you look at some uh, basic definitions of democracy, whether it's related to a fair playing level, yeah. fair playing, you know, uh, the uh, ability of opposition to challenge Erdogan, mm -hmm. or courts to act independently. But still, uh, these are big challenges right now, and I think we are going in the direction of dominant party rule, where a single party controls appointments to bureaucracy, all appointments to bureaucracy, and even judiciary. We mm -hmm. are certainly going into this direction, and opposition tur in Turkey is very weak. That's a big factor. Opposition mm -hmm. remains weak in Turkey, and they lack uh, creativity. And this also contributes to dominant party rule, because I think if we had a powerful opposition in Turkey right now, the uh, situation would have been a lot more different. But our opposition leaders, unfortunately, lack creativity. They are too much into themselves <laughs> and okay. lack perspective on the bigger picture. 
Um, and I want to hear compare, if you if you don't mind, sure. authoritarian successor parties in Turkey and Tunisia. Okay. I think uh, when we discuss, when we compare Turkey and Tunisia, we focus too much on Nahda, AKP, which, you know, yeah. which is important, but also another major element is authoritarian successor parties, which mm -hmm. in, in Tunisia and Turkey, in Tunisia, they have fared very well, especially after 2014, you know, uh, they, they've acquired the largest chunk of, of vote share in parliaments, but uh, for some reason, scholarship keeps ignoring them. <laughs> And this is an area where I want to focus on next. Uh, when we look at uh, authoritarian successor parties in Tunisia, mm -hmm. you see themselves defining as uh, Bourguibist, for instance. Yes. Bourguibi, but they really don't have a clear ideology. They, they, they don't have a clear framework. And they... They wouldn't, they wouldn't because they're just anti-Nahda. So that's the thing. That's the thing. That's the thing. Authoritarian successor parties in Tunisia... Uh, main remained as anti nahda parties. That's their ideology. I mean, yeah. that's their core. That's the thing. And various in Turkey, authoritarian successor parties have institutionalized, and I particularly have JHP, CHP in my mind. They mm -hmm. have institutionalized a, a Kemalist framework, Atatürkist framework. Okay, and that's the embedded, similarity. They yeah. embedded this in a social democrat umbrella. They embedded this in a social democrat umbrella, which, you know, in Tunisia, social democrat parties, Tayyar, uh, Jumhuri, for instance, are distinct from Bourguibis parties. In Tunisia, uh, authoritarian successor parties have taken up the social democrat umbrella ideology. But the problem in Turkey is that they are too hierarchical, too institutionalized. So change is hard to come true okay. in, within these um, authoritarian successor parties. I mean, even people are starting to compare, not that they're similar 100%, but they're comparing how, you know, the secularism of Ataturk and Burgiba uh -huh. and how they are fundamentally against Erdogan and Nahda. That's why Turkey and Tunisia are being constantly compared, whether we're comparing, uh, you know, Erdogan and Nahda or, you know, the others. It's always, you know, they're always being compared and, and similarities and, and differences are being talked about all the time. Yes, but I would I would push back a bit against uh, Ataturk and Erdogan. I think Erdogan today is more Ataturkist than he was, let's say, 10 years ago. Okay. When you read his rhetoric, when you read uh, his speeches, he used to um, he used to struggle against the legacy of Atatürk for a long time, but he came to embrace it, you know, uh, perhaps remold it uh, in his own image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a saying uh, in Turkey. Uh, it's it's a title of a very famous book actually, "Ama um, hangi Atatürk," which means "But which Atatürk?" Uh, each part of the book <laughs> comes to embrace even Islamists come to embrace a certain part of what Ataturk did. And part of, okay, yes. big difference between Tunisia and Turkey is Ataturk's legacy. Burgiba does not have, Burgiba's legacy is not as deep no, as Ataturk's not. legacy. Yeah, 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 I will yeah. give a very concrete example to, if you want to visit Burgiba's mausoleum, you go to Monastir, which is three hours away from capital. Yeah, but yeah. Ataturk's uh, mausoleum is at the heart of Ankara, yeah. and it's at the heart of the city. Yeah. It overlooks the whole city. Its location mm -hmm. is very strategic. Yes. Burgiba's mausoleum, you know, uh, it's, it's at a beautiful spot, but does not really have to do with uh, what's ha what happens in the capital. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's just a visual example. It's just because he's from there, you know, and he got it ready before his death. So, so this is part of regionalism dynamic. In, in yeah. Tunisia too, uh, mm -hmm. part of the dynamic of regionalism, uh, but mm -hmm. Atatürk became Turkey, Turkey, Literally. it became Atatürk, yeah. uh, you know, through... Burgiba did not, Tunisia did not become Burgiba. Yeah. Yes, and I think yeah. part of it has to do with, A, uh, uh, it's unfortunate, I mean, I shouldn't say that, 
Burgiba, uh, uh, when Burgiba lost power, he was too old. Yes. And, uh, bit, he lost the charisma. Okay, when you when I visited Burgiba's museum, all photos were from 1950s or 60s. When people, he was okay. Yeah. People want to remember him as he was young, but they experienced him as he was old. He wanted to be president for life. He yes. chose that. Yeah. Very, yes. Atatürk, Very uh, democratic. Uh, yeah. Unfortunate for Turkey, but Atatürk died young. Uh, when, so people still remember him as this energetic guy yeah, yeah, yeah. who was uh, trying to get Antakya become part of Turkey, who was mm -hmm. still, you know, uh, spending, you know, uh, his days and nights for his own country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the image is different. And um, the successor of Atatürk, Inönü, he may not be known in yeah. Tunisia as much, perhaps mm -hmm. in the Arab world as much, but yeah, yeah. kind of like Ben Ali for us yes. Inönü, uh, he, he he didn't he never had the charisma of Atatürk and he, so and he, he he the dynamic between Ben Ali and Atatürk was not like the dynamic with Inönü ben, dynamic with Ben Ali and Burgiba was not like the dynamic between Atatürk uh, and Inönü yeah, yeah so yeah. Uh, Inönü okay. could not or neither did he want to challenge Atatürk's uh, charisma, Atatürk's mm -hmm. authority? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, back to, um, you know, the description, your description of the status quo now, um, situation in Turkey and in Tunisia. Um, whether we agree it's a coup or not, uh, we both agree that, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, a regression. We're not as democratic as we used to be, both in Tunisia and in Turkey. And a lot of, we do agree on that, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So so the million dollar question is that why is this happening all the time? I mean, why do we have these two Muslim majority countries who were being, you know, icons for democracy, everybody's looking up to them, um, and then out of a sudden we regress and we're not the example that everybody wants to follow anymore. I don't think this has to be do with religion. Uh, you said Muslim majority countries. So yeah, yeah, I'm not saying I'm not linking it to, to no, religion no. per se, but I, we're I like to think I want to relate it to more uh, socioeconomic patterns of development. Yeah, I, I just mentioned that criterion because, <laughs> as you know, everybody in the Muslim in Muslim majority countries are not democratic countries, you know, and we're so, this, I, the, I, the I only ones saying, more or less. But also, we are late comers to industrialization, both Tunisia mm -hmm. and Turkey. Turkey, and we both have. You're still not used to that. I I stopped trying. For me, it's Turkey. <laughs> okay, uh, we, we we both uh, let commerce to industrialization. We both have uh, issues related to state capacity, state weakness. I think, mm. and part of the reason why Kai Said was able to do what he was he achieved is frustration of Tunisians with enduring socioeconomic challenges. And part of the reason why Erdogan was able to acquire so much power is uh, frustration of Turks, for instance, with security challenges, with terrorism attacks. Okay? okay. And both of these issues come to state capacity, state weakness. I think especially if you look at um, how Tunisian uh, leadership, military responded to, uh, or bureaucracy responded to Kaysay's power grab, you see also worries about um, quote unquote Islamists dominating institutions. Yeah. So yeah. in both sides, I think the issue has to do with uh, state capacity, variations in state capacity, how people perceive state institutions and how elite perceive state institutions. If you look at top elite, the top military today in Turkey today, military is happy with Erdogan right mm -hmm. now, for instance, security institutions are happy not because they became Islamic, not because they become Islamicized, but because Erdogan embraced some of the central teams of Atatürk and military establishment. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a two-way interaction. I think uh, a lot of what we see today has to do with patterns of development, but also patterns of security, patterns of state fragmentation. And I think this needs to be uh, the new avenue of research, scholarly research, as we compare, I think, two very important countries of the region, 
Uh, we should, yeah. I think we should, yes, Islam is important. Yes, religious attitudes are important, but also I think an overlooked aspect of our uh, fragmented transition is the role of state, security, and socioeconomic patterns of development. And geopolitics and, as well. And, uh, and uh, I think we are coming to the end. I want to uh, yes. make, a, make a final note. Some people get uh, too frustrated and you know too heartbroken with what happened when, you see, when they see what happened with our countries. I think the opposite way, I, think, I don't think democracy is a single way ticket. I think countries fluctuate uh, between becoming more democratic, becoming more authoritarian. And yeah, I but there are many, many mistakes that could have been avoided. Sure, That's the but, better but, argument. But, but uh, both, both, both countries could have been a lot worse than they are today. True. Uh, that, they could, they could, could have, have been a lot better as well. To, uh, well, uh, both countries uh, uh, could have fallen into civil war. Yes, with Tunisia that didn't in 2014, happen. Turkey in 2016. With yes, Kuwait that didn't and... happen. So I think uh, we we could have been better in so many regarding so many things, but we could have been worse right, <laughs> regarding right, so many things right. as well. Uh, so I think still um, uh, both countries are going to have their opportunities, and both countries are going to offer opportunities for political entrepreneurs with right skills. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But both countries are going to have their own limitations and struggles based on uh, their historical heritage so mm -hmm. so you're really know. hopeful about the future mm -hmm. you're hopeful about the future uh i'm i'm as hopeful as the history of our countries okay wow on this beautiful note uh, i cannot add anything then <laughs> we so, should end right now uh, <laughs> yes okay thank you very much okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's true that we've been, I mean, things, you know, evolve. And even if you have a regression, we can get back on our feet and, and move forward again. Okay, yeah. Tassim, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Saleh. I hope that our viewers benefited from this discussion. And we definitely have to have another episode with you. It will be my pleasure. Thank you very thank you. much. Goodbye.